an issue of great importance. Calvinism has never seemed biblical to me for a number of reasons that we will come to in due order. Over the years, my considerable objections have been discussed privately in detail with several friends who are staunch Calvinists. Thankfully, in spite of our serious differences and our inability to resolve them, there was never any loss of goodwill. We remain in close friendship to this day and simply avoid this subject. It is true that throughout history, many of the great evangelists, missionaries, and stalwart theologians held to the doctrines of grace known as Calvinism. R. C. Sproul declares that the titans of classical Christian scholarship are Calvinists. The additional claim is often made that although many have not made it known publicly, most of today's leading evangelicals in America hold to some form of this doctrine. I soon discovered that there were far more books in print promoting Calvinism than I had ever imagined. Their number and influence are growing rapidly. The New Geneva Study Bible aggressively promotes Calvinism in its marginal explanations of key passages. It claims to represent Reformation truth. That bold phrase equates the Reformation with Calvinism, a proposition that is almost universally accepted among evangelicals today. The question of whether this is true, which we will deal with in the following pages, is surely one of great importance. The significance of our concern is given further weight by the fact that its proponents even claim that Calvinism is pure biblical Christianity in its clearest and purest expression. Dr. James Kennedy has said, I am a Presbyterian because I believe Presbyterianism is the purest form of Calvinism. John Piper writes, The doctrines of grace, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints— are the warp and woof of the biblical gospel cherished by so many saints for centuries. Wouldn't this mean, then, that those who do not preach Calvinism do not preach the gospel? And how could evangelicals possibly be saved who reject the five points of Calvinism that Piper claims are the warp and woof of the biblical gospel? C. H. Spurgeon who at times contradicted Calvinism, declared, Those great truths which are called Calvinism are, I believe, the essential doctrines of the gospel that is in Jesus Christ. Now, I do not ask whether you believe all this, that is, Calvinism. It is possible you may not, but I believe you will before you enter heaven. I am persuaded that as God may have washed your hearts, he will wash your brains before you enter heaven. Such a strong statement is impressive, coming from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. John H. Gerstner writes, We believe with the great Baptist preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon that Calvinism is just another name for Christianity. Again, if Calvinism is true Christianity, would that mean that non-Calvinists are not Christians? Surely, most Calvinists would not say so, but isn't that the implication? Of course, there were many Christian leaders of equal stature in the history of the Church, such as D. L. Moody, who were of the opposite opinion. Norman F. Duty lists more than seventy Christian leaders who, in whole or in part, opposed Calvinism, especially its doctrine of limited atonement. Among them such men as Richard Baxter, John Newton, John and Charles Wesley, John Bunyan, H. C. G. Moole, and others. A study of early church history reveals that Calvinistic doctrines were unknown during the church's first three centuries. From his knowledge of ecclesiastical history, Bishop Davenant declares... It may be truly affirmed that before the dispute between Augustine and Pelagius, there was no question concerning the death of Christ, whether it was to be extended to all mankind or to be confined only to the elect. 
for the fathers, not a word that I know of, occurs among them of the exclusion of any person by the decree of God. They agree that it is actually beneficial to those only who believe, yet they everywhere confess that Christ died in behalf of all mankind. Augustine died in A.D. 429, and up to his time, at least, there is not the slightest evidence that any Christian ever dreamed of a propitiation for the elect alone. Even after him, the doctrine of a limited propitiation was but slowly propagated, and for long but partially received. Today, there is a growing division on this issue, most Calvinists insisting that Christ died only for the elect. On the other hand, IFCA International, a group of about 700 independent evangelical churches and 1,200 pastors, some of them Calvinists, declares in its doctrinal statement, We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for all mankind, to accomplish the redemption of all who trust in him. Spurgeon himself, so often quoted by Calvinists to support their view, was torn between his evangelist's heart that desired the salvation of all and his Calvinistic beliefs. At times he seemed to reject limited atonement, though he often firmly preached it. Sometimes he seemed to contradict himself almost within the same breath. For example, I know there are some who think it necessary to their system of theology to limit the merit of the blood of Jesus. If my theological system needed such limitation, I would cast it to the winds. I cannot, I dare not, allow the thought to find lodging in my mind. It seems so near akin to blasphemy. In Christ's finished work, I see an ocean of merit. My plummet finds no bottom, my eye discerns no shore. There must be sufficient efficacy in the blood of Christ if God had so willed it to have saved not only all in this world, but all in ten thousand worlds. Having a divine person for an offering, it is not consistent to conceive of limited value. Bound and measure are terms inapplicable to the divine sacrifice. The intent of the divine purpose fixes the application of the infinite offering, but does not change it into a finite work. Merit and value must apply to the effect of the cross. If the cross is intended for a limited number, the elect, its merit and value are necessarily limited. If God had so willed it, is the key clause, which Spurgeon clearly denied at times. On the other hand, that Spurgeon believed salvation was available to all mankind is evident from many of his sermons. The contradiction is clear, a fact that Calvinists are reluctant to admit. Thus, I have been accused of misrepresenting and even misquoting C. H. Spurgeon. Sufficient further statements by Spurgeon, see the index, will be presented herein to enable readers to come to their own conclusions. Please visit our website, thebereancall.org, to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to thebereancall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is thebereancall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our e-books are free. I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you can join us again next week. Until then, we encourage you to search the Scriptures 24-7. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back.